So tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you do for fun? Well, I, I really like to play soccer. I've been playing since I was seven. Oh wow, that's awesome. How'd you get into that? I went once to my brother's game, watched him play and thought to myself, I could do better than that. So I turned to my mom and said, sign me up. So what else do you like to do? Well, I've recently started to make YouTube videos actually. No way. What motivated you to start a YouTube channel? The free online storage space. By the way, does YouTube take PDFs? There's people out here trying to start a career on YouTube, but you're here because your Google Drive maxed out on storage space. I respect that. Oh, and also, I'm really into computational chemistry. Oh my God. Are you curious to find out how I got started on it? Oh, hell no. <laughs> All of you guys wake up in the morning and even before you brush your teeth, make yourself coffee, put on slippers, the first thing you ask yourself when you look in the mirror is, what is computational chemistry? <laughs> oh my goodness, no one's gonna watch this video. Also, I just got a tripod, so what's up? What's up from over here? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up from over here? All right, I don't know why I always clap. Maybe it's because nobody ever claps for me. So online, you could probably find a lot of resources on computational chemistry and there's a lot of papers out there on it, but let's just say the papers require patience to understand and probably some baseline knowledge of chemistry. So I'm gonna try to explain what computational chemistry is, assuming that you don't know a lot about chemistry or you're not interested in chemistry and try to give you an intuitive understanding of what it is. In fact, you don't have to know anything to watch my video. The only reason why you need to know chemistry to watch my videos is to appreciate my puns and those are extra credit. As usual, there's only one prerequisite to watching my videos and that's low expectations. So to put it simply, computational chemistry is exactly what it sounds like. Using computational methods to solve chemical problems. But because computational and chemistry are two such broad terms, bringing them together makes an even broader phrase. So we're gonna have to narrow this down in some way. What I mean is that whenever there's a broad term that encompasses so many different things, we're gonna have to establish some sort of segregation or classification to organize all of our thoughts. It's like saying, I like coffee. But do you like cold brew, lattes, frappuccinos, light ice, no ice, extra ice, extra sweet and creamy, light sweet and creamy, oat milk, almond milk, regular milk, lactose free milk? You can't just tell your barista, hey, I want a coffee. You gotta tell them, I want a mid mojito, sweet and creamy, light ice, medium size, but in a large cup. Same thing goes for computational chemistry. We gotta create some sort of structure here. There's no formalism to this. This is just the way that I help myself organize what's going on in the field. And for me, it comes down to three different sections. The first one is development. The second one is simulation slash application. And the third is chem informatics. All of these three different sectors draw upon the same principles and subjects, which are chemistry, classical and quantum mechanics and computing. But each of the sectors emphasize varying levels in each of these subjects in different amounts. So before I go into explaining what each of them are exactly, I just want to point out that the first two I mentioned, which is development and then simulation, are technically two branches of computational chemistry, while chem informatics is a separate entity from computational chemistry in general. My tongue is getting drier than California, trying to say computational chemistry over and over again. Okay, first category, development. Basically, developers in this field develop mathematical models and computational tools that other chemists use to solve their own problems. Some popular examples of these tools could be Gaussian, Avogadro, QChem, Orca, Quantum Espresso. There's a lot out there. And there's currently active work in development in both industry and academia. An example of a company in industry focused on development could be DE Shaw Research or otherwise known as Desres. And an example of people in academia working on this could be the Berkeley chemistry professors 
the head gourds. So out of the three areas of CC that I've outlined, I think one can argue that the area of development demands the greatest understanding of quantum mechanics. And a question that I get asked a lot is why do you need quantum mechanics to understand chemistry in the first place? And the answer is that chemistry is basically physics. Classical mechanics governs the macroscopic world, while quantum mechanics governs the microscopic. In chemistry, when we're looking at atoms and bonds, which are obviously part of the microscopic world, we're gonna have to look to certain rules that govern the physics at this fine of a scale, and that would be quantum mechanics. So in order to understand the role that quantum mechanics plays in chemistry, here's quantum mechanics in 10 seconds. Now in quantum mechanics, there's this thing called the Schrodinger's equation. Oh hell no! Which I'm sure all of you guys have heard at one point. Now what exactly is the Schrodinger's equation? The Schrodinger equation is telling us that you need to subscribe right now to this channel if you haven't already. I'm just kidding, don't unsubscribe. Now the Schrodinger's equation looks really scary, but basically what it's saying is that if you have something, when you act on that thing, what is the output is the energy of that one thing. <gasps> so say we have this salt and we act on it in some way. More rigorously speaking, it's a matrix, but we're acting on the salt. The output of the Schrodinger's equation will be the energy of this amount of salt. As an example, let's look at Gaussian, which is a software package that I mentioned earlier. A common problem that Gaussian tries to solve is how can we optimize the structure of a molecule so that it's lowest in energy? There's so many different permutations and arrangements that a molecule can have. Which arrangement of atoms is the best possible structure? And in this case, the best corresponds to the geometric structure that's lowest in energy. So how can we calculate that amount of energy that each permutation has? Yes, you guessed it, by solving the Schrodinger's equation. Now here's the catch. We could never, technically speaking, solve the Schrodinger's equation 100% accurately. The closest that we can get is an approximation. So you might be asking, so commutational chemistry is basically based on nearly perfect, but not fully correct answers. And you're right. Oh my God! Almost all of computational chemistry is either empirically or intuitively determined. It's like getting 90% on a midterm. You studied, you tried, you did your best, but it's the best that you can do, and it's enough for an A minus. Okay, moving on. Now we know that developers create and build these software packages slash computational tools. Well, the second part of computational chemistry is simulators use the software packages that developers create. This area of focus is very application-based, and you could use already existing developed software packages to basically solve any chemical problem that you have. That could be studying the diels alder reaction more in depth or looking more into the copa rearrangement. And someone who's notable in this field and has published a ton of papers in academia is this professor called Professor Ken Hauk. And I had a chance to do research in his lab for a little bit, which was really fun and valuable. There's this feedback loop that exists between the computational chemist and the synthetic slash experimental chemist. So the synthetic chemists are the ones that you can imagine in the white lab coat who sit in the lab and run all these experiments and they synthesize certain products. So they'll come out with certain results and then they'll turn and look to the computational chemist and ask that with their computational tools, can they verify computationally the results that they achieved in lab? And my mentor used to tell me that there was this great analogy where if synthetic chemists were driving on this car off a cliff, right along behind them would be the computational chemist who would drive off the cliff right along with them. It's like chemist leading the chemist. <laughs> All right, last sector, which is cheminformatics and is technically not a part of computational chemistry. And a lot of people tend to get confused between cheminformatics and computational chemistry. To start off with, the informatics part of cheminformatics is there for a reason. Oh, hell no! You have this buildup of chemical data from past experiments. And from that data, you're gonna extract information to expand your knowledge base. So the first thing that you're always gonna have to do is find some way to represent your system. Now in this case, the system is a molecular structure. And the way we can go about doing this is by a graph or a matrix of zeros and ones or something called a molecular fingerprint. We can create a model or representation of our system in some way and that's necessary because then we can apply some sort of computation on it. Second step is the exciting part. Now we can start using this infamous word machine learning to predict certain properties. Now to break it down, 
Run. Machine learning. It's synonymous to import Keras. LOL, JK. So machine learning, another really broad phrase. What machines are we working with and what are they learning exactly? <laughs> Just like coffee, machine learning is also super broad. Machine learning encompasses methods from traditional methods all the way to new and upcoming methods. Some examples of traditional methods are support vector machines, random forest, linear regression, and new and upcoming methods, which are really exciting and currently making segue in this field, could be ANNs, so artificial neural networks, um, deep learning or DNN, so deep neural networks. Basically the same thing as ANNs, just deeper. <laughs> but the important thing is that chem informatics is a rapidly evolving field that has a lot of potential because of three reasons. The first reason is growing accumulation of chemical data. The second is leveraging CS algorithms. And the third is growing GPU hardware or computing power. So what kind of problems can we solve with chem informatics? Well, for one is computer aided drug design, which is something that we see a lot at pharmaceutical companies. Machine learning serves as this idea generator where we can generate libraries of thousands of possible drug candidates. Now here's where I think it starts to get super exciting. Remember how at the beginning slash middle part of this video, I mentioned that developers draw on quantum mechanic principles in order to build these software packages. Now, chem informatics brings in the question of whether machine learning can supplement or maybe even replace these quantum mechanical calculations that these software packages perform. Because these quantum mechanical calculations or solving the Schrodinger's equation is really computationally expensive. What machine learning can do is bypass solving the Schrodinger's equation and instead get answers to the Schrodinger's equation without actually solving it. It's like cheating and then getting an A minus and then getting a high five. Now there's a lot of speculation behind this. Some people say that using machine learning instead of applying quantum mechanic principles is basically lacking in the elegance that quantum mechanics provides. And some people are saying that deep learning in ends is a black box. So we don't know exactly what these neural nets are doing. Ultimately, I see deep learning or more modern machine learning techniques advancing the field of chemistry in the same ways that it advanced the parent fields of computer vision and speech recognition. I think we might even one day get to a point where you don't even need to have a strong chemical knowledge base to use machine learning to predict certain chemical properties. Bill Gates once said that one day there will be a computer in everyone's home. I say that one day everyone will be performing computational chemistry in their own homes. Oh my god! Fun fact, I was actually Bill Gates in second grade. I dressed up as him, put a shirt, glasses on, and gave like a 10 minute presentation on Bill Gates. My opening line was, what does Bill Gates like more? Cheeseburgers or computers? <laughs> Run. Thanks for watching and for all of the support. I hope you found that interesting in some way. Hope you guys are staying safe, washing your hands, not touching yourself and others. Don't forget to stop, drop, and roll. Just kidding. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.